Hello guys, I'm Big Al Devlin and welcome back to another Pugilism video. And today we're going to be continuing looking at the basic parries. In our last video, if you remember correctly, we covered the basics of the outward parry and touched upon how that might just lead to things such as the clinch and counters. And indeed, that is exactly what we're going to be looking at today. In essence, looking at how we can take advantage of our opponent once we have performed a successful outward parry. In the previous video, we covered the simple counter riposte, which is where once you have performed a successful parry, say with your right arm, you strike your opponent with your free left hand, and obviously vice versa if on the other side. A very simple, yet very effective counter and riposte indeed, used extensively by Daniel Mendoza himself. However, it is at this point that I then begin to now add my own interpretations. For there are so many more things you can do when you have your opponent in this position. Of course, when pugilism first started, there were no rules. You could strike from any position against any part of the opponent's body. And so, in many ways, a lot of the techniques that I interpret here are based upon that lack of rule set, if you wish. However, even as pugilism progressed and became a more civilized sport, during the Broughton rule set, in fact, most of these techniques that I interpret and present here would still, in fact, be legal. The only ones not allowed would be those that strike beneath the belt. One quick note, guys, before I actually present these techniques to yourselves, I do want to say that I am actually going to be writing a book on said subject, presenting a fully immersive training manual, if you wish, instructing the reader on how to best defend themselves in almost any hostile situation. This, of course, will take some time to write, but I am making progress and will give you further news as progress continues. And so now, on to the juicy stuff. When we consider the outward parry, more often than not, we see it simply as a deflection of the strike that is aimed towards our head. And in the most part, of course, this is the case. In fact, it's the simplest way of defending yourself. However, it can be so much more. If on upon the deflection, you are able to grab your opponent's arm, which does not take too much effort. Simply wrapping one's hand around the elbow of the striking arm is enough to catch it at least long enough for then for you to place your opponent at a disadvantageous position. However, note it's not the grab of the arm itself that weakens your opponent, as even though, of course, you do have the inside hold, and there will, of course, be a temptation to strike at the now exposed body and face of your opponent, it also leaves yourself open too. In this point then, the fight becomes an exchange of blows. This is neither advantageous or disadvantageous to you or your opponent. In fact, it will always normally favour the larger and stronger opponent. And even when you do have a large size and strength advantage, that does not mean that you forget how to fight clever. You still must take as much advantage of your opponent as possible to protect yourself from any potential harm. Remember guys, in a real fight, one successful strike to the jaw is simply all it takes to end the fight. And this can come from both you, but also your opponent. So how does one take advantage of being able to grab the aggressor's arm? Well, the next step regardless of strength or dominance, is to then control your opponent's head. Controlling your opponent's head is key in dominating them entirely. By controlling their head, you can affect their balance, their stance, their position, their aggressive opportunities, and of course, you can then minimize their defensive capacity also. In essence, they become a puppet, and you are their puppet master. Ultimately, there are two ways in which you can gain a grip, and a solid one at that, around your opponent's head. The first is called the swan neck grip, called as such because the hand mimics the shape of a swan's neck. You arch your hand essentially inwards, 
the palm trying to touch the wrist and you hook this ultimately around then the back of your opponent's head. This gives you a great fulcrum to which to pull upon the opponent and throw them off balance or bring them towards blows such as knees to the body. Believe it or not, even though this is only a single hold grip around the head, it is incredibly hard to get out of, especially when latched onto your opponent with great strength and technique. And so once latched on, the fun begins. One of the first options available to you is to use the arm that you have locked around your opponent's head to essentially thrust an elbow either into their throat or into their mouth or the basal nose. If thrust into just underneath the nose, that's the basal nose, the bit between essentially the lip and the nose, then this can be used to great effect with a thrusting action to throw the opponent's head back and to take them off balance and even potentially knock them to the ground. Bear in mind this is also a strike and a powerful one at that, a strike which may alone be enough to finish your opponent. However, it seems almost to be at a loss to have worked so hard to get a grip upon the opponent's head to only really let it go for a single or yet powerful and destructive strike to the face. Instead, if we concentrate in pulling the opponent's head downwards slightly to the side, hooking our hand around the head even tighter, we can then begin to create opportunity to strike our opponent with our legs and our knees. There's a few general rules of thumb when it comes to lower strikes guys, or strikes coming from your lower body to be more specific, and that is, first of all, legs require greater range than strikes coming from the upper body. In addition, although of course there are exceptions, most lower body strikes are also slower. Consequently, they are far easier to catch and if your foot is caught, then you are in deep trouble as the attacker as you are very easily put off balance and brought down to the ground. And again, to stress what I said before, this is why we must control the head of our opponent. If we can control the head of our opponent, we can not only control the range which we are, dictating the optimum distance for the strikes which we want to throw, but also by controlling the head, we not only block their vision, but we affect their posture and their balance and thus their ability to counter these lower body strikes. However, the last rule of thumb about lower body strikes, guys, is that they hurt a lot more and are much more likely to end the fight. And so as I've been talking, guys, on the screen in front of you, you would have seen the variety of techniques that you can use from such a distance effectively. The easiest of these to perform is most likely the knee. This is a versatile close range attack and the analog of the elbow. It is very effective as it can be used to strike the belly at a number of different angles, including the ribs. It can also attack the lower limbs of your opponent aimed specifically at just above the knee, causing strain to the knee joint, slowing down your opponent, whilst also, of course, inflicting a great deal of pain. And if you are strong enough and technical enough to be able to bring your opponent he opponent's head low enough, then of course their head becomes a prime target. A single knee strike to the face of your opponent if not enough to knock them out entirely, and if it isn't, well, they are one tough son of a bitch. But if not strong enough to knock your opponent out, it will certainly make a right mess, breaking their nose and most likely taking several teeth out. However, knees are not your only option. In fact, one of the most devastating options, and, and something that you can use from range also very effectively, as it's almost impossible to catch, is the stamp kick. The stamp kick, or sometimes called the shin breaker, is a kick directed either towards the side of the knee of your opponent or towards their shin stroke ankle. Really, the target just simply depends upon how close you are to your opponent. The closer you are, the lower down, essentially, you have to aim. Now, it's important when throwing the stamp kick that you do so in an almost sideways manner, so it's not totally front on. Front on does work, but it only really does damage if the opponent's knee is completely straight upon the strike. 
at that point it would cause hyperextension of the knee. However, whether the knee is straight or bent, it is still at risk from a side-on or slightly side-on strike from a stamp kick as it tends to rupture and damage and strain cruciate ligaments. Lovely. Depending on footwear also, um, if you have sturdy boots on, this can also be aimed at the opponent's shin. And again, another general rule of thumb, the lower down the shin you aim, the thinner the bone, the more vulnerable the leg. And so a sturdy stamp towards the bottom of the shin, as I say, more towards the ankle joint, can do a tremendous amount of damage and even end the fight instantly. However, let's not forget the upper body. Elbows are perhaps one of the most devastating close range strikes one can make. And although we mentioned them briefly earlier in the video, we haven't really mentioned them to their true extent so far regards the close range clinch and their use within it. However, the reason I've not mentioned them as such as of yet is because at this moment in time, we've been discussing the swan neck grip hold upon your opponent. This is a partial clinch. This is only a one-handed grip upon your opponent, and although when performed correctly can be a very strong hold, it is not perhaps the greatest. More importantly, for you to throw an elbow from this position, as mentioned earlier, you actually have to take your grip off your opponent, so it's a single strike. You are trading your grip around the opponent's head for a single powerful blow to the face of your opponent. And so really only becomes a worthwhile trade when you know that you are about to lose control of your opponent anyway. If your grip is about to slide off, well, hey ho, you know, who cares if you let go and hit them in the face with an elbow at this point? Nothing lost, everything gained. However, a plethora of choices of elbow are available to you if you were instead to engage your opponent in a full blown clinch. You will have seen this clinch actually on the footage on the screen in front of you playing throughout this entire video. And it is a position sometimes called the standing chantry. It is a very powerful hold upon your opponent and if placed around your opponent, especially if they have no experience at how to get out of it, something that we will cover in another video, then ultimately you can then control the fight there on in. They are not going to get out. It is like having a vice grip on them. What is the full clinch? Well, it's the full clinch is actually having both hands behind the back of the head of the opponent. In contrast, for example, to the swan neck grip that we've discussed already, which only has one hand placed behind the head. Now, I know some of you may now be asking the question quite rightfully also, why would we ever use a swan neck grip? Well, the swan neck grip is easier to latch onto your opponent, especially if you've been turned side on yourself and you are a disadvantage, uh, defensively speaking. It's quite quick and easy to put on. But also, even from an aggressive point of view, when you go to put on a full clinch or a standing chantry upon your opponent, quite simply, their guard can get in the way. They will, If they have their, uh, their backhand up, defending their chin, it is actually quite hard to get your hand around the back of the head. Whereas if you have already immobilized one of their arms, such as through the outward parry, then you have a, an open gateway, if you wish, to thrust your hand forwards and perform a swan neck grip. However, if possible, and you have the choice of grips to place upon your opponent, always engage with the full clinch or the standing chantry. The reason for such is that one, it gives a greater control over the head of your opponent. It's harder to break out of. It disrupts their balance and their posture even more. And in fact, a canny um, employer of the full chantry will actually be able to rest his weight onto his opponent, also tiring them out. Especially if, again, you're the, la the taller, larger and heavier opponent. This is a great way to slow down and tire out a fitter, faster um, uh, fighter. However, its true advantage comes from the fact that because you have two hands placed upon the back of your opponent's head, you can take one hand off intermittently to strike with your upper body. None of the lower body strikes that we've mentioned before are ruled out either. You can perform all of these equally, if not better from such a position, because now that you have two hands placed upon your opponent, it is very easy to take one off without losing your grip. 
This, as I say, opens you up to elbows. The before choice that you have is the elbow to the top of the eye, the sort of over the head elbow, if you wish, the side elbow, typically targeting the cheekbone of your opponent or the throat of your opponent, in which case at this point it becomes more of a thrusting elbow when placed towards the uh, throat or towards the uh, collarbone. And also in addition to this, you have the spike elbow, a spike elbow is essentially where your hand would be almost pointing upwards um, and the elbow is literally used almost like a spear tip thrusted typically into the jaw of your opponent but again the cheekbone or even the orbit of the eye especially the eyeball itself is a great target for such a strike in addition because of the increased leverage and strength of this grip you can also find it possible to bring the head of your opponent completely downwards. If this is the case, it's normally end game because the options that of damage that you can inflict are a knee to the face, as we described earlier, a very powerful strike. And remember, you don't have to just throw one. You keep kneeing them to the head and the face until they come down. Or, of course, you can use the, um, the elbow to the back of the head. A very dangerous move, typically outlawed in most modern day fighting as it can cause paralysis but it is very good and very effective for taking your opponent out incredibly quickly being in a full clinch that is a standing chantry you can actually turn this very easily into a full chantry that is essentially a headlock at this point even though perhaps you cannot get some of the big power blows you can get into by bringing your opponent, uh, opponent's head down directly in front of you, you pretty much have a vice grip around the head that is almost unbreakable, and at that point, the head is exposed, ready to be pummeled by your fists until, in essence, they are knocked out. So, these are the transitions that you must look for and must endeavor to try to perform upon your opponent to end a fight rightfully and justly and of course as quickly as possible and just one thing to finish guys one more thing and then i promise i'll, I'll leave you be and let you get on with your lives um but um if your opponent is highly predictable and these days most opponents will not perform an outward parry they will instead attempt to evade and jot dodge out of the way of your punch if they keep doing this then all you need to do a simple word of wisdom from uh, perhaps a more experienced man is once you have gained the measure of your opponent and realize that they are pulling to one direction every time you attempt to throw a jab for example simply feint the jab watch them dodge and as they are doing it literally at the same time so simultaneously uh, at the same time as you're throwing that feint throw the cross or the hook on the opposite side certainly a good way to punish people for predictable fighting but it's also a note to you fellas also please do not do the same moves over and over again. Do not attempt to parry every 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 punch thrown your way. Sometimes evade. Other times simply block. Be unpredictable. Be chaotic. Be focused chaos if you wish when it comes to fighting and you won't do too bad at all. Anyway, guys, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, as I say, we're still really covering the basics here, the simple moves and, and transitions within uh, not only pugilism, but my own, as I say, my own interpretation of pugilism. This is my own fight style added in. As I say, I will be putting this into a book. I'll be doing an e-book, uh, but I also intend to do a public publicization of a hard copy also. Um, for those of you who enjoyed the channel, those of you who certainly enjoyed these videos, um, please keep your eyes open. As I say, probably be a little while from now when the book will be available. But if you want to support the channel, support myself, um, and get a really nice book in the in, in the process or an ebook, um, then keep your eyes open and um, uh, get a copy uh, as it's out. I, I will be letting you know when, when it's finished. Um, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, guys, ta ta. So long, farewell, and uh, what have we just said? <laughs> bye bye, guys.